seven of don't keep mum the podcast today is g is for guilt grief and glow and today with us we've got colorful body positive mum lisa hodson hi lisa hi what 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 do those three words encompass well the the mum guilt i think most parents will go through and it's definitely been a huge thing for me um i have chronic fatigue and a huge sort of that affects how i parent quite a lot so it means I can't do as much as you kind of anticipate when you're thinking about being a parent and as much as a lot of other parents can do so there's a lot of guilt with that about you know not being the parent that you wish you could be and the parent that you wish you could be for your children Um, and then alongside that the grief kind of links in with that because you're kind of mourning a life that you thought you were going to have that's not the same and you're mourning the parent that you thought you were going to be that you can't be um having the diagnosis has brought about so many changes I've had to make that I've been forced to make and obviously none of it's through choice so yeah the guilt and the grief goes sort of hand in hand really when it comes to dealing with that and a lot of that do you think it it boils down to the perception of chronic fatigue or do you think it just it do you think it it's just your your version of mum guilt that we that we all carry it in some way or another yeah, I think a lot of it's pressure on yourselves. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. I mean, at the end of the day, my kids don't know any different than what I am. Yeah. So it's not come from them. And anything that comes on you from other people is their problem, really. So yeah. I try. I mean, it's difficult because, like, my mum and my sister are quite of a certain type of personality. They deal with things in a certain way. And I was always like that too. But I've had to change that from my diagnosis and so I feel a lot of pressure from how I grew up and how I feel I should be to how I am now and I judge myself a lot so there's a lot of guilt that comes along with that um but most of it is just pressure from myself really about how I wish I was and how what I want to do um and I just it's just not possible a lot of the time um and I feel I deal with it a lot better than I did initially um, but there are still always times when, you know, I wish I could have done things more than I was able to. Do you think um, getting a diagnosis has, has helped a lot with that? Because you, you must have been just carrying so, so much of all of this, kind of like silently, yeah. really, and unrecognised. Well, Holly was two and Jack was about six months when I was diagnosed. I've always had it, I think, but the having two they're only 18 months apart so having two quite close together sort of triggered it um so I think I dealt with it okay with Holly when I was when it was just her but with having the two that's what sort of tipped it over the edge and it gave me a reason yeah and a bit more understanding of why things were happening yeah. as they were um but also with that especially with a chronic fatigue diagnosis there's no cure it's just management so that's quite difficult. And I know for quite some time afterwards, I was trying to sort of think, could it be this? Could it be that? Yeah. Like at one point I was like, it must be diabetes. And at one point I was like, it must be hormonal. You know, you kind of reach for the illnesses that you know there's something can, more can start, be done about. I feel like, I don't know, because your situation is so relatable for me because it's the same with, with my two. I, because I had them later on, so I had them in like my mid to late 30s, I had them almost back, back to back as fast as I humanly could. Yeah. I, think, I think there's like 20 months between the, the two of them. And I'm in a similar position now that I have a lot of pain in my body just constantly. So like at the moment, my, my left shoulder's out, my left knee's swollen, and I feel like a hypochondriac because I'm like constantly trying to work out what it could be and, you know, yeah. it's like, you don't, it's almost these days, especially with the, like the, the NHS, God love them, unless you can provide them with what you think the diagnosis is for them to confirm, they're not really very proactive at, at working out why you're in pain or where that pain's come from. But well, yeah. I'm fortunate that my doctor, because chronic fatigue is quite, it's not understood very well by a lot of the medical profession. And there's a lot of um, prejudice and misconceptions about what it is and how to treat it. Fortunately, my doctor was really good 
Um, but it is a diagnosis by eliminating everything else. Yeah. So have a lot of blood tests and stuff like that before you can discover if if nothing else, it must be this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think my I was then referred to a chronic fatigue clinic and I have um a lady I speak to there, but I think she was she probably sees it a lot of people the same that are sort of almost in denial about it and they're like, Well, maybe it's this, well, maybe it's that. And I could tell every time she was like, mm-hmm, yeah, you can go see if it's that, but it's probably not. <laughs> that that's that, that I, I can I can relate to that. I, I think I think, I mean, again, there's no real like the last <laughs> the last appointment that I had with my doctor. Um, kind of went along the lines of I think you should probably have a mental wellness check Joe like no. you're coming up with all of these all of these things that are wrong with you and what I was trying to explain to them was that I don't want to be unwell I don't want there to be anything wrong and ideally because I know I'm in pain I know not, something's not right I want it to be something that I can fix so I want you to tell me what the problem is so we can find the answer I because I don't yeah. want to be sick you know I don't I don't want to be inactive or unable to fulfill my role as mum like you say the way that you want to want to be yeah but it is uh, and I think probably it is a tough one because I think probably just generally most mums and parents feel absolutely battered for the for the first probably half decade of being a parent anyway (laughs) you know without anything else layered on on yeah but I think you know regardless of having a serious illness and stuff there is so much that affects you just going through pregnancy and going through labor and then all your hormones shifting and everything else I think it's rare for a woman to come out of that and not have some kind of problem and then obviously you've got to parent on top of all that it's so difficult and I just feel like it's not talked about yeah enough and it's also not treated enough because it's just seen as, oh, well, it's just a side effect of having a baby. So I'll deal yeah. with it. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it kind of leads on to the, the, the glow word that we, we were talking about, because I remember for me, one of my biggest frustrations was that um, I didn't enjoy either one of my pregnancies. They were both yeah. horrendous. I was poorly the whole time. You know, my body didn't work how I wanted it to work. I thought I was going to be one of these like really dynamic pregnant women. And Jay, when people used to talk about the pregnancy glow, I remember like being there like eight and a half months. It's like, when, 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 (laughs) when do you get this glow? Because I am just like this sweaty, achy, bright red mess of a was like horrendous. So uncomfortable. I could hardly breathe. I had SPD, so I could hardly walk. Yeah, no, no. But one of my friends is one of those that glowed. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it, as well? Like, I think that, when, when you talk about like chronic fatigue, things like, is it fibromyalgia? I never know how to, to say it. Or even like, even arthritis. I think what happens is that if somebody hasn't experienced it, they can't relate to it. And it's, the, it's almost, this, it's the same with pregnancy and the kind of labor that you have. If you've had a good pregnancy and if you've, or you've had a good labor or both, you can't relate to like the horror stories that you hear or like the, the pain or recovery that a lot of women have to to go through so yeah. the way, you know the way you kind of get that justification on how you're feeling all depends on who you've got to have those conversations with well yeah and I think you sort of find those people that are either people that have gone through similar or people who are sort of naturally able to relate to situations that maybe they've not gone through but they can put themselves in your position I think you kind of have to find those people not everybody's going to be that person and that's just human nature not everybody's the same um and it took sort of with relation to my chronic fatigue you know my really close friends they really struggled at first and they weren't very supportive they just didn't get it and I think like a lot of people they kind of just think you're just a bit tired um, and since then, because it's been nine, ten years, you no, know, nine years since my diagnosis, you know, they're, they're great about it now and they understand a lot better because they've seen and experienced what it's been like. Um, but, you know, at first it is hard to understand something like that. And like you say, if you've not been through it yourself or if you've not even had any sort of mental health problems or you don't know anybody that's had any mental health problems, it's really hard to understand what it's like. Yeah, 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 I... I I could I would definitely agree with that were you in your friendship group were you one of the first ones to have kids um we were all around the same time our children are some of them are months apart the biggest age gap is a year so 
uh, I wasn't the first but I wasn't far behind yeah and how did how did you find that did that did that help having other friends kind of yeah. going through similar experiences with yeah kids? definitely because yeah just so you can relate to each other and you know when I was struggling and stuff like that I would go over and we would just sit all the kids in the front room to play and we would just collapse on the sofa probably not even right. talk uh, quite a lot a lot of time just sit on our phones but it was just nice to have somebody to do that with rather than sitting on your own in your own house because that is one of the things I really struggled with once I had the two was being in on my own I used to sort of get quite ang- anxious about sitting at home on my own I would always have to either be going to my mum's going to my in-laws going to my friends it was just a scary thought to be on my own with two young children and yeah. what was I going to do I remember just like just being sat there thinking I can't I can't do it and being afraid of like everything because I was you know, trying to um, almost do like a health and safety check on every activity or every part of like the living day like of what could happen and you know I've only got two arms and there's two kids and what about if one goes this way and one goes that way it yeah. can send you into a complete spin but yeah having having support and another G word having grandparents I guess around yeah. around about is like a big makes a big difference yeah because my mom and dad are an hour away from me so having my in-laws only 15 minutes away like I was there so much and yeah <laughs> I, I think they probably knew most times I was going around I was going to bed and I got there <laughs> never sort of they never let on that they were just like yeah come over it's fine and then I'd get there and 10 minutes later I'd be like do you mind if I go to sleep because oh, I was so <laughs> tired um, but they were great and they were I couldn't have done it without them and without friends and support I would have really struggled yeah, I think for, for me, like that, that's the big privilege of coming from a big family is that um, even though I'm the eldest, because I had mine later, it meant that all the siblings end up having their kids relative at like around about the same time. So my younger brother and me are for his first two kids and my two kids are exactly the same age. Oh, really? Yeah. So like every family gathering, it was it was the same, like like they could all entertain each other. There's enough adults here that if we do 50-50 split, half of us can go to have a sleep, the other half can watch, and then we can just, like, yeah. tag each other in, in and out. And I think, you know, in days gone past, they, the community, there was so, so much more of a community, and they all helped each other out, and you kind of have to create that for yourself now, because it's not the same people travel further, people go to university further away from families and stuff like that. We're a lot more spread out than we used to be, so it is I mean the whole thing about it takes a village to raise a child and you just have to find your own because otherwise it's isolating it's just it's so difficult it's lonely um I think it's I mean that must have been so hard for people over the last year for new mums and things like that who couldn't go out to groups and stuff because I mean not necessarily groups for me but just getting out and going to a play center and meeting a friend for a coffee was just you know so important and so necessary because I just would have gone even further into a dark pit if I'd have just been stuck on my own I think one of the I mean we we met uh, we met like blog cam didn't we that was organized by like the tots 100 yeah I remember, <laughs> I remember being so like relieved when I met all all of you all of you guys because we were all like parents well the majority of us were parents and we had had blogs it was just so nice to have people to relate to yeah I think one of the big things for me that's always um got captured my attention with your especially with your grid and with your blog is the idea of like having a glow of using color to kind of like lift your yourself do you know, like and even like e- even in the way that you style yourself you, you can see that you take power from your from your clothes do you know your your hair's always bright and vibrant you I mean your nails the post day of your nails oh my god I don't even normally get my nails done and I almost like I was like I need to put myself in I need this I need, I need some color yeah I've, I've just always loved bright stuff and and I'm not I've always well when I was younger I was a lot more introverted than I am now but I was never scared to wear bright colors and I suppose stand out in my own way um I don't know it's my little bit of self-care I guess uh, have especially my hair and my make my nails um, being done um, and I just yeah I'm just drawn to bright colors and bright things it makes me happy um, and I try and fill my wardrobe with as much brightness as I can you've got like the wardrobe of dreams it's like Carrie's <laughs> Carrie's wardrobe from Sex in the City but a lot less organized <laughs> can't see the floor it's covered in clothes oh yeah you've got a floor drobe and a wardrobe yeah 
<laughs> the, the thing is, though, I think for, for both of us, because we, we've been doing lots of collaborations this past, past year, doing stuff like yeah. with the Reels, which has been really, really lovely for me. It's been really nice, like a good motivation to keep creative. But I think one of the biggest things that we've probably both been working really hard on is trying not to give a beep, you know, not, not letting things get to you. And I think that's probably, that's probably like a big learning curve that most mums have to go through, especially with there being so much social media presence these days for ev- everybody. Yeah. And with the majority of, majority of us doing our socialising online, it is it is difficult not to let things get to you. So, I mean, do you use creativity to help you get through those kind of funks? Do you use like reels and, and your blog to, to work your way through those feelings? Um, I definitely used my blog for that when I first started because we were in America and I was on my own a lot and that was my outlet. It was my way of being more creative. It was my way of getting to know other people and it was a way to share things with family that weren't around. Um, I do tend to find the if I'm feeling a bit crap, I don't do as much and I find the creativity more difficult. But more recently, I'm trying to push through that because um, I do find if you just keep going, it eventually does come back. Um, and I just, I think, I don't know if it's lockdown or what it is at the moment, but Instagram has just become a place of sort of comfort and inspiration. And it's just become such a, that really sounds sad and people that don't know it don't get it but it's become a really big part of my life in the last year um I mean the things like our friendship um you know you get so much from it that people don't realize and don't see um yeah it is it's 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 a hub isn't it yeah it's it's nice it's nice to be able to I mean in regardless of lockdown with us being on different sides of the country we wouldn't ever be able to see each other reg- regularly so being able to do lives with each other being able to do like collaborations even just checking checking in and and like giving advice on stuff that we post about like you said it sounds sad but I don't know what um what I would have done without without Instagram through lockdown so it's it's been it's been a lifeline for me yeah definitely I mean I didn't use it much in the first one I think I went off completely because I just found it all so overwhelming. Um, but once I got back on, yeah, it was just like a bit of um, a bit of an anchor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that I'd say that I'd, I'd agree with that completely. Yeah, it just gave you a focus because there was no focus because we yeah. just had everything was just taken from us, wasn't it? So yeah, it just gave me that thing to do, that little bit of way to reach out to people um, that I just didn't have otherwise. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's not, it's not that, um, I don't, I think you probably feel the same. It's not that I feel defined by Instagram. No. It's not no. that I need it to kind of like validate my, myself, but it has been a really nice way to, to tap in and, and meet other, other people, especially mm. like-minded people. So people that are, you know, they, they might, they might be parents. They might also be creative. They might also be working. You know, there's all like all the different elements that are going on in my life. I can I can hone in and find people that are going through exactly the same thing, which is yeah. nice. It's nice because, like even today, Joe we trying to um, book in to do the podcast. We we're both in the same boat, so it's so easy to to coordinate with each with each other. Yeah. Whereas you know, if I was trying to do that with somebody who had a completely different lifestyle to me, it'd be a lot harder to to work to work out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It it's, it does. It sounds horrible, doesn't it, to give Instagram so much value? But yeah. No, no. But I think the other thing, the other side of it is for people, uh, for parents going on and things like that, is the comparison. And Instagram is very pretty. It's very glossy. You only see one side of things, and I think you've got to be really careful as well not to compare because, as much as you see all that, there's all sorts going on behind the scenes. I mean, m- me myself, I try and share reality as much as I can I don't always have the energy to do it though and I've I've not done many face-to-face stories for quite some time because I've just not had the energy to do it um but just be conscious that what you see is not everything um so try not to sort of look on there and think I'm failing as a parent not doing all these amazing things I saw um I think it was Lauren Ashley Gordon was talking yesterday on her stories or Monday it was sorry 
And she was saying, you know, the sun's out, they're on half term, all these people are going out and doing these amazing things and you feel like you should be out doing all these amazing yeah. things. But actually, you don't need to. You can just sit at home. You don't even have to sit in the sun if you don't want to sit in the sun. Just do whatever feels right for you and don't feel like because everybody else is doing stuff that you should be doing stuff because your kids don't care. You know, as long as they're happy and fed, then they're happy doing whatever. No, we had... um. So like we've had so much going on here that on Tuesday, so me and Yanni were like, yay, bank holiday weekend, it's over. The kids can go back to school. And I had like a really early um office meeting. He took the kids to school and then came back mid mid meeting. I was like, what what are you doing? Why are the, why are the kids here? It's like, because it's half term. And I was, oh, like, no. <laughs> I was like, and I knew that. I knew that. Like I had been talking about it with my sister on the Friday. But I'd still gone through the motions. And yeah. then I was like, I was like, oh my God, and it's half term and I haven't planned any activities and, and I'm working and they've had to work, walk all the way there and all the other kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> and, and then I turned around and like, it was like, and it was so funny. We were at the school and we had our lunch boxes and the gate was locked and he, he was oh. fine. It was like, yeah. for him, that was a, an adventure. And he was like, he was fine about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, talking to me now, later today, and she was like, oh, have you done lots of things this half term? And I was like, <laughs> no, actually. And like, even our paddling pool burst, so I can't even get that out for bits. I think Jay, what you were saying about Instagram with the, like the comparison, because comparison is like the thief of joy, isn't it? Yeah. I think the, the big thing is finding your, your bubble, you know, finding your little group of people that you, you know, that you can, you can lean on or that you can just be, yeah. you can be honest with the whole comparison thing is that when you have people that you know that are giving like honest stories because I feel the same with you like I feel your grid is beautiful but behind each photo is often a story so like them you did a really lovely reel on the on the trampoline and I remember (laughs) thinking like where did she get the energy like and then at the end of the reel there's you like and I I thought yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's, like, yeah, that's why I love her she's in this really gorgeous dress it's a really beautiful day but also <laughs> yeah, she's she's pissing with sweat and she's knackered <laughs> seriously the, and, and every single like outfit change at the end of it I was like I'm gonna be sick I can't I'm dizzy <laughs> we're doing it for the art for the art yeah <laughs> yeah do you have any other g words that you can think of uh it depends what you want to talk about there's growth yeah I mean I think not letting the little things get to you the same and just take just getting on with things and taking each day as it comes instead of trying to dwell on things too much or overanalyze things I mean I still do that but you kind of just I guess these things are just things you do as you get older as well yeah you just sort of learn what to let go and what doesn't matter and yeah. what is important and what to focus on and things like that. And that just, you know, helps you grow as a person. And I've seen you just kind of, you've done this like huge kind of almost like Wonder Woman spin and this beautiful butterfly has just, just <laughs> emerged. Jace, and you, but you, you can see it. Like I can see that you, you hold, hold yourself completely differently and I feel like it has a lot to do with, like you're talking about growth and talk. It, I think you've done a lot mentally to, to kind of like grow this new opinion of yourself and new feelings about your, yourself. I think it just came to a point where I was just like, how much stuff can I worry about? <laughs> I've got so much like things to do with that if my body changes, you know what? But the thing is what I've said in the past was that in my teens and my 20s it was a huge part of me was how I am being slim and being attractive and so and as it's a bit it's so complicated it's such such a complex topic but um you don't get less attractive the bigger you get but you kind Mm -hmm. of are taught that in media and and everybody you speak to I mean I said to John my husband recently the amount of times I sit with friends and the main thing people talk about is the figures the weight the change the diets and we just don't realize it it's just a normal part of conversation and I sit there now and I'm like do you realize how much energy and time you are focusing on something that at the end of the day doesn't bloody matter Um, as long as you're healthy and 
there are so many different forms of healthy. That is the other thing as well, that people just assume if you put weight on, you're not healthy anymore. Or if you're skinny, you are healthy. It just doesn't work like that. I am not healthy. I have got an illness that I will never be healthy. Um, and yes, maybe if I was a bit slimmer, then there are parts of me that would be healthier. But then getting to that point would probably put me in an unhealthy mindset. Um, but also I think I've just started following more people and listening to more people who talk about it who are bigger but talk much more about weight and plus size and how to deal with it and how to approach it and all the different mindsets around it that that's really sort of changed my mindset and I'm just at a point now where I'm just like you know no I don't fit into those size 10 clothes anymore I don't fit into the size 12 clothes anymore so I'm not going to look good in them because I don't fit in them. So wear stuff that you fit in and that you feel good in. And, you know, you will feel good. You will yeah. feel better. About it, is, it is difficult because I think as well, like if you're not, because if you, even if you're not somebody where those intrusive thoughts are like on your mind, if you're around people enough that are talking about it, you always mm. start thinking, should I be worrying about yeah. it? Like, exactly. and you always start in- looking at parts of your body that you would never have looked at before. But also people get so defensive if they say something like they just don't get what you're saying is actually helpful. Yeah. And a more helpful and more a better mindset for you. They, a lot of people, if I say anything about you don't need to lose weight, but you look great as you are, but you know, this and that and the other, they just sort of come at you with arguments of yeah. like, well, health side and that people, it's just the way people are brainwashed almost to think that they should be a certain way um so you sit in those conversations and I just it's so funny now thinking about it that I never realized how much people worry about it and talk about it so much yeah no I even um so even for me like this this past year because my knee basically gave out two weeks before we went into lockdown which was what not good because obviously like the the doctor's doors were closed. I decided to go and get a PT because after doing a bit of reading, I I found out that you can um, reduce the pain in your joints if you strengthen the muscles around you so that they're taking more of the the impact. And the amount of people that said to me, so are you getting back into your old clothes now? You're doing doing the gym sessions. Uh, like the amount of times I've had to say to people, this is not about losing weight. And actually, actually I'm probably heavier than when I, when I started. It's about yeah. getting, getting stronger and being painless. Like it has, it has nothing to do with the, you know, like my clothes size or it has nothing to do with the way that I, I look. You know, my left knee hurts more than my right knee. So I might even end up with like a left leg with a bigger, bigger muscle than my right <laughs> leg. <laughs> if that's going to help, that's what I'll, I'll do. None of this is to do with aesthetics. You no, know, I'm not against diets. I'm not against um, exercise, um, but do it for you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, how others perceive you and what you think you should look like. Yeah, I think my I think my big thing is because when when I was younger, I was very small, and I had it, I, like I hit puberty really late. But I like everything hit me in one go. So I like turned fifteen, I grew like two foot. My boobs like my boobs part was <laughs> like one summer I, I left as like a four year old and I came back as a fifteen year old. <laughs> and so I remember like it, as a kid, it was all, always about like trying to get as much food into your face as possible. So I never really had that. Um, I never had a mum that uh, that did diets. Do yeah. I remember a lot of my friends growing up, their mums were always on like a cabbage diet or, you know, like a keto diet. There was always some kind of diet, but my mum was never really like, like that. But my big thing has been my, my confidence. So like my inner perception of my, of myself, like the way people perceive my character. So that's been, that's been like a huge one for me. But I think like you say, you just have to let it go. Like, people's opinions of you are completely their problem they have nothing to do with you do you know, like if someone wants to have a bad opinion about you let that be a reflection of of them not a yeah. reflection of of you and actually they can say what they want there's no there's no need for you to hear it or give it any any airtime. and I think yeah. that's probably the 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 biggest and bestest lesson that all of us can can learn from Instagram from being parents from from lockdown from all of this is just kind of looking at what you're doing, like looking at like looking at being colourful, 
you know looking at being being positive about your about yourself you know not I think break you know, break yourself down less and build yourself up more yeah probably like I think the thing is that we can say these words and they're very easy said but we know ourselves that these things yeah. do take work it's yeah. not just as straightforward as somebody saying put on a nice dress and you'll yeah. amazing feel amazing but it has to start somewhere and it's getting to the point where you can recognize the way you feel and do you want to change it do you want to feel better and making those little steps to start that yeah. going Thank you, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for, for talking to us. It's always lovely talking to you. Um, if anybody wants to go and find Lisa, you can, um, you blog under Holly Bobs, right? Yeah, so, Holly Bobs everything. Yeah, so Instagram, you're on TikTok, aren't you? Facebook, you've got your blog. Yeah. Holly Bobs, Lisa, Lisa Hodson. Yeah. Yeah. Follow, follow the glittery trail, trail of sparkliness. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's change the world today.